today we are here with Dr. Jordan Cook from Moore Equine, who is uh, the track veterinarian for the Standard Reds in, uh, in Alberta. And I have to say that I've worked with you before for quite a few years, and I want to say that you are the most knowledgeable veterinarian I've worked with, plus the most kind and compassionate. You really do put the horses first, you really try. And I think a lot of horses would have liked you, which we all thank you. Um, can you tell us, give us some background of what got you into being a veterinarian and yeah. really where you've been? So I'm originally from Ontario. I graduated from the Ontario Veterinary College in 2010. Uh, I did my internship here in Alberta at Moore Equine um, until 2011. We went back to Ontario and worked at a sport horse practice. I'm doing a combination of work at Mohawk Racetrack as well as sport horse medicine um, for another five years uh, before I got, a, I got a call asking if I wanted to move back to Alberta. Uh, so I've been back here at Moore Equine uh, since 2015. Uh, recently, I became an owner here at uh, Moore Equine, so I'm, I'm committed to the mountains. <laughs> um, the year I moved out here, Century Downs Racetrack opened uh, just around the corner from the clinic, so just on the outskirts of Calgary, uh, primarily hosting standard bread racing. Uh, and since I had worked on standard breads at Oten, Ontario, and they're kind of a huge passion of mine, um, that became one of my ventures to sort of move back into the standard bread world uh, as sort of one arm of my practice. So I'm one of the primary veterinarians at Century Downs, um, where I'm there uh, basically every day, or one of us is there every day for sort of routine check-ins on all of the, the patients and all of the standard breads that are stabled at the track, um, as well as being there on actual race day, uh, so that we're there to, again, kind of check in on all these horses before they race, after they race, um, if there's any kind of treatments that are needed, uh, if there's any diagnostics that are needed, then we're available, um, as well as um, to my on-farm trainers as well. Um, kind of the other arm of my practice is more in the, the performance horse side of things. Um, so I am certified in chiropractic and acupuncture work, and I would say that's a huge portion of my performance and sport horse practice is really kind of focusing on what I call the whole horse approach. Um, so I do everything for a lot of my patients where not only do they, I do their chiropractic and acupuncture care, but I do their dental work, I do their vaccines, I do a little bit of everything um, in order to sort of make sure that these horses are getting sort of their top-notch care, um, feeling as good as they can. Uh, and so out in Alberta, that can range to everything from sort of jumpers at Spruce uh, to Western performance in the Calgary Stampede and sort of a little bit of everything in between. Um, so that's sort of my, my primary role out here and I like it. It's, it, it gives me a little bit of balance. Um, the racetrack world is a little bit more casual. You know, a lot of these guys I consider my family because I've known them for so many years. Um, and then my, my riding horse world is maybe a little bit more uh, kind of upbeat and anxious and, and sort of stressing about the show that weekend. Uh, and so it, it's a, you know, a little bit of both and I, I love having, having both in, in my life. Yeah, and, and to mention that you have you had your own standard bread too mm -hmm. as a ra riding horse. And so I'd like you to tell us a little bit about him. Yeah. He's a pretty special guy. So I had a horse called Greek Ruler. Uh, he raced until he was 12 years old. Um, he was retired from racing because he developed a heart condition, just like in people, called atrial fibrillation. Um, you sometimes will hear of that in race horses called a flipped heart. So what that means is that instead of their heart beating in a normal rhythm, so love dub, love dub, love dub, it is a little bit more sporadic. You'll, you'll, I'm sure you probably know of a person that has atrial fibrillation. So their heart beats a little bit erratically. So they might go love dub, love dub, love dub, love dub, dub, love dub. So it's a little bit more erratic. Um, and otherwise, I mean, he was bright, he ate the same, we were still able to you know, do a lot of the same things that a normal horse would. He just physically couldn't pump oxygen fast enough to go as fast as his competitors anymore. Um, uh, so he was retired to me. I had fallen in love with him a few years prior and kind of told everybody that when his race career was done, he was mine. So he sort of got dropped off on my doorstep. <laughs> and uh, so we um, did perform a treatment on him to try and convert his heart back into normal rhythm, uh, which was successful, but unfortunately only lasted for a couple months before he went back into atrial fibrillation. 
Um, and, but otherwise, I mean, he was a pretty special guy for me. We did everything from just kind of hacking around the fields, going over little jumps to, you know, practicing some massage work, hacking in the mountains, um, just sort of overall a, a pretty brave partner to me uh, and his heart. Uh, I did have it checked out by specialists. So every year we'd have an ultrasound of his heart or an echo done um, just to make sure nothing was changing, make sure that it was staying happy and healthy. Um, but I mean, he never put a foot wrong. He never noticed anything in his energy level. He could still go and gallop across the field just as well as anybody else. Uh, and uh, unfortunately I had to put him down this past fall. He developed a, a tumor in his head, which would be very rare, of course, it would happen to a veterinarian. Every other horse would have, you know, tooth root infection or, or something. Um, uh, but uh, unfortunately, he, he had a tumor that we diagnosed on a CT scan. Uh, so we have all the same diagnostics for horses as we do for people. Uh, and so he had a, a pretty comfortable, happy summer until sort of one day he said, okay, today's the day, mom. And uh, so unfortunately I put him down, but he was a big, yeah. big part of my life and uh, definitely a big link to that standard red world, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was lucky he found you. Yes, so, yeah, he was a good boy. Um, we just want to talk about some common issues that mm -hmm. racing standard reds have. So in that world first, yeah. and then we'll go into how we deal with them once they transition into other careers. So uh, what do you feel, what predisposes them to injury? So standards are really hardy. Um, you know, when we think of race horses, traditionally people think of thoroughbreds. So, you know, thoroughbreds are a little bit more in the media. Um, they're a little finer bone, they're going um, generally closer to the same speed, but we're the, the kind of the galloping, they're a little bit more common in racetracks. Standard rides are a little bit more of a smaller circuit. Um, they are traveling in either the trot or the pace. Um, here in Alberta, we just have pacers, which means they travel on the diagonal. So it, they travel with, you know, that, that right front and that right hind will move together, and then that left front and that left hind will move together um, as compared to your traditional trotters. You'll find trotters and pacers more on the east coast um, compared to just pacers here. Um, so by having two legs on the ground at the same time compared to a thoroughbred at the gallop, if you kind of watch a gallop in slow motion, they always only have one leg on the ground at one time. So you have 1,200 pounds putting force and weight on one leg. Standard reds are able to balance that by having two legs on the ground at one time. So we see a lot less injury, thankfully, than we do in, in thoroughbreds, just because they're able to kind of balance their weight a little bit more. Um, different things that I may be looking at are mainly from a performance standpoint. So why is this horse not going as fast as maybe it has in the past, or it's not going as fast as maybe the trainer anticipates that it should be able to go? So I kind of run through a list of things that I do. So I do an overall check of the horse. I'm listening to that horse's heart. Are there any murmurs? Are there any arrhythmias that might be why this horse is unable to pump oxygen as fast and unable to go as fast. Um, we may be doing an endoscopic exam of this horse, so passing a tube up their nose into their lungs and actually looking for any evidence of allergies. We may be looking for any evidence of actual structural abnormalities um, that are contributing to that horse getting, again, less oxygen. So you'll hear a term called flipping their palate. And so what that means is that they're so normally just like in people they have an epiglottis in their airway that sticks forward and kind of holds their palate down and you'll just like in us when they swallow the epiglottis flips up covers their airway so the food can go up and over it well sometimes whether that is partially genetic and conformational and how that horse's throat is put together um, and sometimes a little bit that excitement and that, that sort of rush of adrenaline when racing that gets a horse really fired up, they're breathing really deeply. What can actually happen is the pellet, which sits, that is attached to the tongue, um, which sits below the epiglottis, will actually flip over top, and then all of a sudden become kind of like this little billowing um, 
balloon that can actually block their airway. So you'll hear horses making gurgling noises or flipping their palate. Um, it's called dorsal displacement of the soft palate. So we can look on a scope to see if a horse is doing that, which might be reducing the amount of oxygen that they're getting in their lungs um, we, and, and contributing to poor performance. Um, again, kind of we're looking for allergies. There's a lot of different tests that we can do to check a horse for allergies. Uh, sometimes we might be drawing blood on a horse to look for systemic conditions. Is this horse sick? Are there changes in its white cells or its red cells? Um, are there changes in its organ function? Um, do they have evidence of what's called tying up? So tying up is just like in people. You go for a run when you have a baby worked as hard for that 5K as you were ready for, and you come back and you don't feel too bad, but by that night, oh, your legs are sore, you're a little bit crampy. Horses can get the same thing. Um, and so think of it almost like a full body cramp where they've maybe exerted themselves beyond where they were ready. Um, sometimes it can be secondary to, again, other conditions. So we're checking their muscle enzymes as their reasons why um, their body's feeling a little bit sore. Then again, I'm gonna kind of go over this whole horse's body. Is there aches and pains, not in joints and tendons and ligaments in their back, in their neck, that, that may be contributing to this horse not traveling as efficiently as it should be? Um, and can I be using some chiropractic or acupuncture care in order to help these horses feel a little bit more symmetric and carry themselves more comfortably? Um, I might be checking their teeth, uh, just like, again, in a regular horse. Um, if there's abnormalities in their mouth, um, that can make them more likely to kind of fuss with the bits a little bit. It might make them harder to drive and, again, can impact performance. Um, and, and even just looking at simple things like talking to trainers about bedding, diet, hay source. Um, once we've diagnosed some issues, are there little tweaks that we can do for this horse to again kind of maximize its performance and reduce the impact of other conditions we might see. Uh, I'm also there in case of emergencies. So just like our everyday horses who, you know, like to call it because the sky is blue, yeah. um, standard breads can have some of these issues, albeit much less commonly than we would see in a riding horse. So because these horses are on such a regular routine, they have a regular feed program, they have a regular exercise program that they get very used to, they get outside, they're moving every day. Um, knock on wood, I see substantially less colic, especially less severe colic. You know, those kind of colics that need to come into the clinic, those kind of colics that, that necessitate either surgery or even euthanasia. If I see a colic most of the time, it's very mild, maybe a little gas colic, maybe a little baby that's sensitive, you know, after his first race yeah. or something like that. Um, but for the most part, I don't see colic very often. Um, again, we can have horses that who knows what they do to themselves in the stall, come in and they've got a little nick or a cut or something that maybe needs some stitches, um, you know, and, and so we do see those same type of emergencies like we would in the, in the real world. Um, but I would see it, again, less, less commonly. Um, so most of my everyday work is, is what I call for help, where I'm going into every single shed row, I'm checking in with my trainers, I'm checking in with my grooms, you know, how's that horse doing? How's this horse doing? Hey doc, while you're here, can you, you know, take a look? I think he just bumped it, but let's make sure that the tendon feels okay. Or, hey, I think this horse has a foot abscess, let's take a look at it. Um, What's pretty amazing at the racetrack is the, t the horsemanship that these men and women have, um, where a lot of the times they have a really good gut instinct on, you know, I'm a little bit worried about this one, or hey, I think this horse is a foot abscess. A lot of the times they're right, and what's, what's really nice is if we say, okay, yeah, this horse just bumped its tendon, or this horse has, you know, a little bit of a cellulitis, or this or that, the app, it, I mean, these trainers have already done a lot of the things that I rec would normally recommend. So they've cold hose, they've put a wrap on the leg, they, you know, um, uh, they've, they've um, kind of already called me and said, hey, I'm giving this horse some anti-inflammatories, checked in. They've already done a lot of the treatments that I would have mm -hmm. prescribed anyways. Um, and so that gives me a really good indication of how well this horse is responding to that and does more need to be done or less need to be done. We need to be taking x-rays or ultrasounding or, you know, what are our next steps? Um, and so it, it's really nice because, I mean, these horses are getting top-notch care. They're getting 
their BMO blankets, they're getting chiropractic and acupuncture, they're getting massage, they're getting laser, they're, you know, they're getting their light therapy treatments. Um, some of our training centers even have access to things like pools and salt water spas. Um, so there are different training, integral training methods. Um, and so we, you know, they, they get their legs wrapped, they get every kind of supplement you can imagine, make sure their joints feel good, their red blood cells are feeling good, their energy level's good. Um, and, and so, I mean, these horses learn to do a lot, but also um, the trainers are giving them the utmost care. And uh, same with the grooms. I mean, the grooms are the ones I rely on because they're the ones that touch them every day, they groom them every day. They're rubbing their legs and touching their legs. So a lot of the times, you know, the trainer will say, hey, can you go check on on this one? Because the groom mentioned yeah. something seemed off or something seemed wrong or, or, you know, the horse came back from the race a little different than it normally has or uh, they pulled it out of the stall and noticed a little lump or a bump. And, and I mean, the, the grooms are definitely paramount in this because they're the ones that are sort of the, the eyes and the hands for, for the animal mm -hmm. to tell me what uh, is different. Yeah, which is different than... Uh or horses at home that, you know, they're out in the pasture, you yeah. feed them twice a day, and yeah. then you, you kind of put your eyes on yeah. them, but not necessarily yeah. hands yeah. on them. Okay. Um, I mean, I, in it's other situations, every yeah. Day. Every day, all day, mm -hmm. you know, seven days a week. Yes. yes. Uh -huh. yes. I mean, it's, a, it's they're, they're sort of the unsung heroes of, yeah. of the, sure. the standard part of the racetrack world. They're there seven days a week. They're on yeah. race days. I mean, a lot of them are there between five and six in the morning, and they, depending on if, what time we're racing out, they may not leave until one or two in the morning that night after mm -hmm. the races are over. Um, and they're making sure every horse is put away, every horse has been taken care of and fed and watered um, throughout the day, and, and that they, you know, came out of the races all right mm -hmm. before they leave. So, um, you know, kudos to the grooms and the trainers for the long hours that they put in, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Horses appreciate it. Um, what types of injuries are most prevalent? Um, so some of that can be gait dependent. So again, yeah. kind of we see slightly different injuries in trotters versus pacers. Um, I'll touch more on pacers just because that is a little bit more of what I see out here in Alberta. Um, so we we do see a little bit of, of soft tissue injuries, just like you would kind of in, in any course. Um, we can see what's called an injury to superficial uh, flexor tendons or SDF tendons. Um, so those tendons are the ones that run down the very back of the front leg. Um, so in riding horses, we see them less commonly unless those horses maybe when kind of did a slip in the field or something like that. You'll hear that referred to as a bow. Um, in standard rides, we see them a little bit more commonly, and again, part of that is, is because they're reaching so far, and say the surface um, is maybe it has rain, and so it's a little bit slippery or something like that, or it's a little heavier, a little bit deeper than it usually is. We can occasionally see those horses just from kind of that constant impact of reaching forwards, they put a little bit extra stress and strain on those SDF tendons, so we can see bows. Mm -hmm. um, so the legs will get a little bit swollen, a little bit of heat, you know, we put an ultrasound on and we can notice that there's a tear there. Um, thankfully, those injuries actually heal really, really well with prescribed treatment. Um, they often need a bit of time off from racing, um, but it's not uncommon to see horses that have had those injuries, they'll continue to race for years and years afterwards. We see the occasional suspensory ligament injury, um, again, depending on, um, uh, that's just sort of that same thing where there's a lot of reach. Um, we see it in every breed, every type of horse. We see it every type of discipline. Suspensory injuries are kind of common across the board. They are not unique to standard breaks, um, but they are a type of injury that I see. Um, in pacers specifically, we can see a little bit of stress and strain to the spikal joints. And part of that is because conformationally, they're a little bit straighter behind to get that real swing to come through in the pace. Um, but also because again, with the pace compared to a trot, the pace is very much a swing gait with the hind legs. So they really swing those legs around to reach forwards. Um, whereas with a trot, you know, in, in riding horses, we're always focusing on the trot and lifting up and engaging those quads. Well, the pace, we get a lot less quad engagement. Mm -hmm. So we need the quads. So the, the stifle joint in the horse is the same as our knee. So we have our quads that come down and then they form the patella ligaments that hold the kneecap in place. 
And so in us, if you have knee pain, your doctor's gonna tell you to work on things like squats, or you may find stairs hard if your quads are weak, because if your quads are weak, then what happens is those ligaments are loose and then your, your kneecap is gonna move around in the joint. Well, the same thing happens in vertebrates, And so you'll hear of horses that have maybe loose stifles um, or are locking or catching their stifles. And that refers to exactly what I just described, where they have weak quads, those ligaments are a little bit lax. So as they're picking up their legs and coming around, those ligaments might kind of catch a little bit and that kneecap might move a little more than usual. So it's, it's definitely an area that we might look at sort of making slight changes to that horse's training program. So doing a bit more work on the trot instead of on the pace to try and strengthen those quads. Um, we may look at taking some x-rays, looking at the actual stifle joint, making sure there isn't a problem in the actual joint itself, um, and, and doing some more rehab exercises along with some chiropractic and acupuncture work to, to try and strengthen those quads as much as possible. Just because they have loose stifles does not necessarily, you know, it doesn't deter me from turning that horse say having another career afterwards. Um, a lot of it is, again, just sort of confirmational from the breed mm -hmm. and combined with the gait. Um, but that horse may benefit from additional exercises once it's retired um, that maybe are a little bit more challenging for me to get my trainers to, you know, take them over trot poles, for example. Right. Um, but as a riding horse, you know, really working on things to really engage those quads um, can be really beneficial in the future mm -hmm. for a horse that if you've heard it, you know, it's, it's slipped its stifles or, or has slipping stifles or locking stifles. Um, thankfully, Bad, you know, really bad injuries. Um, you know, uh, you'll hear, unfortunately, in the media, we've all heard of Barbaro, you know, who mm. broke his leg, um, the thoroughbred. Thankfully, those injuries in standard reds are, are substantially less common. Again, all because they're landing on two legs instead mm -hmm. of four. Um, so what we call breakdown injuries are few and far between. Yeah. I find myself somewhat. Um, it is very rare that I have to deal with those. Um, thankfully, the if I do, again, those types of injuries are not to the degree that something like Barbaro's would be. Um, you know, we, we often have really mild small little hairline fractures that these horses with um, either time off or occasionally they might need a surgery to place a screw just like a human would, those horses return return to work and return to racing and return to racing at just a high level as they were before. Yeah, um, you know, they're having a hairline fracture in a standard bread is not a deterrent to say that horse's career is finished. Um, I, I have a number of my patients that have had um, you know, fracture repair surgery done or time off after a fracture, and they have come back and competed at the same level that they were before and, and done really, really well. So, you know, thankfully, those type of big injuries in standard reds are substantially less common. So, I would say those are kind of the main types of injuries that I deal with, but kind of catastrophic breakdowns are. are quite rare. Um, so it's more sort of trying to catch, and again, that's where my grooms and my trainers are amazing. They'll catch a tiny little bumper, a tiny little bit of heat before a big problem happens. So we've already got the ultrasound on, we're already trying to sort of change that horse's workload or give it some time off or treat things before it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think partly why standards are so hardy is because of their training program early in their life where they're at a year and a half old when they start driving they don't pull much weight yeah but they do miles, endless, miles, miles and, and miles. distance yes on a hard surface and yeah. and uh, that just yeah these horses are conditioned very differently um and so they they aren't going any so when when the horses are young typically when they're sort of just coming to they are trained to to have a harness on, they're trained to pull um, the jog cart behind them, and then they are started just like anyone training to run a marathon. Mm -hmm. Long, slow miles. Mm -hmm. So these guys might start by, okay, well, we're gonna go basically up and down the driveway. Then we're gonna go halfway around the track. Then we're gonna go around the track. And slowly over, um, I mean, typically from the time they're started to the time they actually race, 
minimum eight to 12 months in between that, um, that time. And that is all what we would call jogging miles. Mm -hmm. So those horses have what, um, it kind of, a, again, on the track, they would say this horse has a good bottom in it. So yeah. these horse has a foundation where these horses have lots and lots of miles to make sure that not only cardiovascularly are they fit, but that their muscles and tendons and ligaments and bones have adapted to going the pace and going the miles needed so that we're not all of a sudden taking a horse, pulling it out of the stall and saying, okay, you need to go pace in two minutes. It's, yeah. They have had lots and lots of miles to get there where they'll jog long, slow miles. And then um, the, the standards work a little differently where they'll do almost interval training. So those horses will come out and they'll go training trips where they'll go a faster mile. Sometimes they'll go a, a you know, a, a faster mile twice. So they'll, they'll go out where they're not going race speed, but they'll go out and do interval training just like we would do. So they'll go out, they'll warm up, they'll go up, you know, a somewhat fast mile. And then a half an hour later, they might go a slightly faster mile. Um, and so they, interval training has been shown in athletes to be very effective and, and so that's mm -hmm. kind of crossed over into the standard red world to do a little bit of interval training um, it's interesting when you know each trainer has a slightly different method for how fast they're going to go or um, when they're going to do some interval training in the time prior to a race mm -hmm. each of them and part of that comes with how they were trained it comes with what works for the horse each horse is on a very individual program i find um, and also what they have found works best to optimize the performance of their right. animal. There are some horses that they never train. I mean, no, I, yeah. uh, I, I think back of, of Greek's training, yeah, I was going to say Greek's training method was he would lead. So he wouldn't even jog. He never was hooked up in the harness. Right. He would lead. So what that means is you've got somebody that's jogging another horse and then they've just got him on a lead row. On the, on the, on exactly. The yeah, yeah. He's, he would got to just follow along. He didn't have to carry the extra weight. He didn't yeah. have to pull anybody. He just kind of, he got his miles in. He didn't train. He didn't do anything because, you know, his, his at that time, sort of 10, 11, 12 year old legs didn't necessarily need that time. And so it meant because he was already fit. So he just needed that extra time. He was racing every week. So it meant that his joints and his bones and his ligaments and everything felt the best they could mm -hmm. leading into his race because he knew his job. So he mm -hmm. didn't need to go out and learn how to pace. He was able to just kind of go do his job every week. And, and that was that. So again, each horse has a slightly different method and each trainer has a slightly different method that we sometimes tweak in order to maximize their performance, just like in human athletes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you pretty much covered it uh, with what you're saying, but what treatments are available for these injuries? But I think you've, your acupuncture and yeah. your yeah, I mean, and again, just like in riding horses, depending on what the injury is, um, we we can treat it the same as, I, I mean, I would, their treatments are going to be no different than what I would treat my barrel horse with, what I would treat my show jumper with. So in some cases, that might be things like regenerative therapies, you might hear PRP, ProStride, IRAP, um, regenerative therapies, we may look at shockwave therapy, we might look at um, you know, different joint injections. We, we may look at laser therapy. You know, there's, there are so many things that I can do and, and that's kind of from an injury standpoint, but obviously there's a lot of other things I can do when I'm looking at if this horse has allergies, so environmental management. These horses, you know, can go on puffers and different treatments, the exact same as, mm -hmm. as your horse might if they, if they are diagnosed with allergies, they have the same diagnostics, the same treatments. The biggest difference when it comes to all of these treatments is what we call withdrawal times. So um, horse racing in general, not just standard bred racing, um, in Canada has to follow the CPMA or Canadian Paramutual Agency guidelines. So that is a federal agency controlled by the government that creates a list of, of all medications and what their withdrawal time from racing is. And that's basically to protect the, the betting public, because it is a betting sport, to show that these horses have not received any medications within X number of hours of racing. Typically, that's 24, 48, 96, 
depending on the medication, but there are no medications in their horse's system that might be performance enhancing, that you know, we're not intending to cover up any pain, and you know, we're not intending to make that horse be able to race faster, or race slower, um, and, uh, and so all of our race horses are drug tested as per these guidelines. So they get urine or blood drawn after the race that is sent away for drug testing. Um, and there are substantial penalties, fines, suspensions, if a trainer was to get a positive. Um, and, and so no, nobody wants to get a positive. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, you're, the, the racing industry can get a little bit of a bad rap because everyone goes, oh, well, you know, they're pushing all these drugs into these horses. Well, we're not allowed. To, to, to be frank, you know, your your local jackpot has more horses running on buttes on it than, than my guys do because the standards aren't allowed to race on butte. So there are no pain meds in this horse's system when they are racing. That is just them racing on literally hay and oats because mm -hmm. all of the medications have, are cut off so that there is no... Uh, impact left in their system by the time they're racing. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have to kind of look at treating things a little bit differently. So again, kind of chiropractic and acupuncture care. If we are going to be, say, treating joints, those have to be treated really far out from racing. So often those horses might have to miss, um, kind of miss a week of racing or we have to plan ahead. If we're treating things like allergies, um, again, a lot of our medications have a withdrawal time on them. So we're looking at Yes, we might be using things like peppers, we might be using things like a nebulizer or flexineb, we might be using um, anti-inflammatory medications just like a human would, just like you would um, for your own horse that has allergies, but also looking at environmental management, you know, what's their hay source, what's their bedding. Um, we're trying to manage these horses in different ways because we can't just give them a puffer and send them out to race. It doesn't work that way. So, um, it, I mean, our, our, the drug testing system is very, very strict. So you can be rest assured that, yes, we have a lot of treatments available. The exact same treatment options that are available to your, uh, your horse at home or, or even to your person. In some cases, horse medicine, you know, equine medicine is way more advanced than, than where we're at in people because this is kind of the, the test run first. Regenerative therapies in horses have been around for years and years and years, and it's only just becoming kind of bigger in for use in people um but again kind of from a drug testing standpoint those we we know that those horses do not have any of those treatments in their system um when they're when they're raising but mm -hmm. yeah there's uh, so many different treatment options available yeah. depending on the horse's injury yeah. so yeah uh, are there illnesses or conditions apart from injuries that race horses are more subject to I would say that the biggest ones that we see are, are allergies, so equine asthma or inflammatory airway disease. Um, they just kind of renamed it in the last year, but uh, just like in you know people, we can see horses that are more prone to dry, dusty environments. You know, dust in hay, dusty shavings. Um, in Alberta, we do see the BC smoke come in every year, so we can see that smoke kind of irritate these horses. Um, so, for example, we actually have smoke guidelines, so if the air quality index is above a certain level, we will cancel racing uh, for the protection of, of the horse and, and obviously the people. Um, and so we're looking at, at kind of a diagnosing inflammatory airway disease. Um, sometimes we can diagnose that on an endoscopic exam. Sometimes we need what's called a BAL or, or um, a lung wash, where we actually are taking a sample of all the cells out of their lungs to look for inflammation, bacteria, molds, different types of things that might be triggering allergies. Um, and, uh, and then how do we go about preventing that? Um, other things we might see kind of secondary to that, or you may hear of horses being called bleeders, mm -hmm. um, or you'll notice in your program that that horse is on a medication called Lasix. So um, EIPH, or exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage, is the same as, as a bleeder. There are some horses that have a tendency to basically burst little blood vessels in their lungs while they're racing. They're exerting themselves at very, very high speeds. There's a lot of lung pressure being developed. And so there's kind of a combination of factors onto why a horse might, might bleed, where does that horse have any inflammatory airway disease that's causing irritation in their airway, and then it, that irritation is making them more likely to bleed. 
do we have upper airway obstruction? So remember how I kind of talked about we'll scope the throat to look for um, sort of changes or abnormalities in how their, their actual larynx works. Well, if you have sort of a change in how your airway functions, it's a little bit narrow, they flip their palate, we're gonna dramatically increase mm -hmm. airway pressure because that horse is all of a sudden not getting enough oxygen, so they're gonna go <gasps> and take really deep breaths to try and get oxygen. And so then that can burst those little micro blood vessels in their lungs, again, causing a little bit of bleeding in there. Um, stress, so same thing in people um, where we have horses that are really stressed or anxious, um, and that can be both a positive stress and a negative stress. Definitely a lot of my racers, they know it's race day and they are where to go and they want to get out there. Um, and so there can be a little bit of anxiety associated with going out to race. Um, and I, so again, they kind of might be huffing and blowing a little bit. They've got themselves a little bit worked up. We may refer to it as washed out, um, depending on kind of if it's sort of a negative stress versus a positive stress, but they, they bleed, um, they can bleed because again, they're, they're changing that pulmonary pressure. Um, and can generally, there is a small population, um, less so in standard breads compared to thoroughbreds, where genetically they just have a higher propensity to have a little bit of bleeding at high exertional exercise. So, um, what we do is if we do identify that there's been EIPH on an endoscope, then we are going to look at, okay, let's start pulling out and starting to kind of address some of these factors and see if we can't get that bleeding to dissipate. Um, sometimes we will look at using Lasix, so Lasix is a medication called furosemide, to help some of these horses that despite all of the treatments that we're doing, they still have a tendency towards EIPH. So Lasix is a diuretic, so it helps to reduce, um, again, kind of that blood pressure in the airways, and so then they're less likely to develop EIPH during a race. So if you notice an L on your program, that means that horse is being administered Lasix. So normally Lasix would be a controlled medication. Again, it's not allowed to be administered within a race. If they're identified by a veterinarian as having EIPH, and in discussion with the trainer, as well as the commission vet, who's sort of our overseeing government veterinarian, we all agree that it would be beneficial for this horse to be put on Lasix. Um, we can kind of all, all sign, sign our forms to say that yes, this horse is going on Lasix. So that horse is administered Lasix under very strict conditions. They have to be administered Lasix four hours prior to their post time. It has to be administered in our test barn, it has to be supervised, it has to be very specific dosing, so they can't just go ahead and say, oh, I'm gonna give my horse this much today. It's very specific dosing. Again, it's witnessed by multiple people, racing officials, myself, etc. cetera, um, and so then uh, we all sort of have to sign to say that this horse was administered this amount of medication, because again, normally it's a controlled or prohibited medication. So, and then we need to make sure that the betting public is aware that this horse did receive this medication. Um, and then once they're on that medication, they have to be on it for a certain period of time. And again, kind of get approval from, from um, veterinarians in order to then remove that horse off of Lasix by, by proving it doesn't necessarily need it anymore. So um, other kind of conditions we might run into are again, tying up. Um, so I would say from a, that would be the only other thing that we might see uh, is is horses that get a little stiff, they get a little sore after they race. Um, it can be anything from mild, where you know that horse just seems a little bit stiff, to that horse has a really hard time even walking out of the mm -hmm. stall. Um, and um, the biggest thing is we'll usually immediately run blood, look at what our muscle enzymes are. In very, very rare cases, those horses can tie up. Thankfully, again, not typically seen in sort of a, a fit racing standard bread. I'm more likely to see this, say, in uh, a riding horse that maybe has been on stall rest for a really long time and then all of a sudden gets turned out in a paddock where it runs around like an idiot for an hour and isn't fit enough to do that. Um, so when muscles are damaged, they release pigments into the bloodstream, which are then filtered by the kidneys. So if you have a lot of muscle damage all at once, that's a lot of pigments that go into the kidneys and can actually damage the kidneys. We'll start to see that it, where we're watching that horse's urine. So if we have a horse that's tied up, those grooms are on it. They are watching that horse to see, has it peed? What color is it? Mm -hmm. Normally it should be obviously like a straw yellow. If we're seeing a trend towards sort of like a brownie or a black color, or even a little bit of a red color, I'm really worried about those kidneys. Um, and so we are you know, often running IV fluids. We're for sure getting blood right away. 
again, knock on wood, it, most of our stagger birds really fit. So it's yeah. not, we're not seeing it to that yeah. degree. We're just seeing a little bit of leg cramping. Um, that maybe we need to look at what is this horse's training program, exercise program. Um, maybe they they get turned out on their day off instead of um, maybe just a hand walk. They need to move a little bit more. Maybe in some cases they need to jog a little bit more. Um, maybe we need to consider using some muscle relaxants during the week mm -hmm. to, to try and sort of settle down some of those cramping muscles after an episode. Um, so we, we look at treating them a different way. But those are, I would say, the most common sort of non-musculoskeletal kind of conditions that I would treat. Yeah. Yeah. My own horse was a bleeder, and that's mm -hmm. kind of was one of his career ending things, but totally didn't ever mm -hmm. come yep. up again. It was never a problem. Yeah, and, and we, I mean, for example, barrel horses, so barrel racers, <laughs> there is a very high incidence of EIPH or bleeding yeah, in barrel yeah. racers because literally for 15 to 20 seconds, those horses are going top speed. And so they, same thing as, as uh, whether it's a standard red or a third red, um, you know, they, they have a tendency towards it because they're going as hard as they can, as fast as they can. Um, and so it's something that I'll diagnose in a lot of my barrel racers where we'll scope them after a run and we, mm -hmm. we see it. So it is definitely not unique to just a standard yeah. bread and it's yeah. not unique to just a racehorse. Um, we do see it in, we've seen it in jumpers. Um, again, we'll sometimes see it in even your average riding horse. Maybe they have undiagnosed allergies to go along with mm -hmm. it or, or other conditions that are kind of predisposing to it. So just because again, a horse is a bleeder, it doesn't mean it can't go and do 99.999% yeah. of the things that you want to do with it, yeah. but maybe it's not going to win the Kentucky Derby. No. <laughs> and, and that's kind of a good That was fine with me. <laughs> uh, what would be a reason for standard bread to be retired from racing? What's what's career ending for them there? So standard breads, again, are, are really different from thoroughbreds in that standard breads often have really long race careers. Mm -hmm. So these horses, um, like Greek was 12, um, most standard reds, I would say, maybe retire in that sort of five to 10 year old range. They're, they're racing for a long time. Um, the kind of the cutoff is 14. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we'll see a lot of horses retire at 14. I, I mean, I, the track right now, I've got a couple patients in their 10s, 11s, 12, mm -hmm. that are still racing um, and, and doing great and competitive at it and, you know, winning races. Um, so a lot of times, the, kind of the biggest reason we might see them retire from racing is what we would call because they're no longer competitive or they yeah. age out where they just become a little bit older, a little bit, slower. you know, kind of slower or maybe a little creakier <laughs> that they can no longer compete at the higher speeds that are necessary. Um, sometimes it might depend on the trainer. That horse might get sold to a different race a trainer at a different racetrack, or maybe they go a little bit slower, right? Yeah. And and so they can be more competitive. Um, from Alberta, for example, we'll see horses go to um, British Columbia. British Columbia, we might see them go to California, um, even Manitoba, right. where maybe they go a little bit slower. Little bit exactly, yeah. and so it's a little bit easier, and then they can race quite a bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that's kind of I would say the primary reason that horses are they're just they're just not competitive anymore and or um, they they aren't um, going fast enough anymore. Mm -hmm. um, less common reasons are, are some of the things that we mentioned where maybe that horse is having um, uh, some sort of upper airway. You know, maybe they are flipping their palate, and we have tried different things to try and reduce that but maybe it's becoming, again, performance enhancing enough that this horse has reached its optimal speed and is no longer able to go fast enough. Um, again, with those conditions, those horses can still be amazing. Riding horses, mm -hmm. uh, you know, trail horses, driving horses, but going the speeds necessary to be a competitive racehorse are not there. Um, I would say it's substantially less rare for me to have a horse retire just because it has an injury. Um, Maybe it had, again, if we have a horse when they're younger, if they have an injury, most guys and most trainers are, they'll do the treatments, they'll give them the rehab and the time off and everything they need and bring them back. Um, occasionally we will have horses that maybe they, they re-injured an old suspensory or they re-injured uh, an old bow or something like that. Um, sometimes 
I've seen where they have fluke injuries that they're turned out in the field. And so right. they, they get retired from racing because they did something otherwise stupid right. to themselves. Yeah. Um, it, you know, again, kind of rarely we'll have a horse that maybe does have a little hairline fracture that they decide that, okay, we, you know, we're, we'll give the horse the time off, but we're not going to bring it back to the races. Or we're at this point, we have the budget to put a screw in it, which is what mm -hmm. the horse needs. And again, there's nothing saying that horse can't be returned to work. It just may have an issue with returning to high speed racehorse work. Mm -hmm. um, but with appropriate time and appropriate rehab and, and management, likely those horses can be really good at their jobs afterwards. So those are probably the most common mm -hmm. reasons, um, but truly kind of aging out and decreased performance are gonna be the, the most mm -hmm. common reasons, yeah. yeah. Many years ago, I had a horse named Cash Power. I got him from Sanford Panda, and he was 12 years old, and Sanford said, he just doesn't want to do yep. that anymore. Yep, so, yep. So he came to me as a 12-year-old, so. Well, and to attest <laughs> that, which is funny, so Greek was 12 when he retired, when he was, I can't remember if he was 13 or 14, he competed in the undersaddle pace race at oh, Century. Yeah. Yep, and so that is a race where we take um, off the track sort of retired standard reds and we put saddles on their back along with their hobbles and they we only we only went I think five eighths of a mile or something like that um, and they competed under saddle for charity at the pace so you had a bunch of girls screaming on their back and going as hard and as fast as they can and so Greek had a split heart at this time so he was in atrial fibrillation. Man, he loved every second of that. I had to put blinkers on him. I had to put ear like earmuffs in him because he got to the track and was just like, I'm ready, I'm doing this. And he heard the horn when the start car started and he put every ounce into that he could. And, uh, and considering he could still physically only go so fast, um, so there was one, one girl who prepped for this every year. So her, her horse was fit and way ahead of everybody. I mean, Greek still, he fought and he got second by a nose. And even though he still physically shouldn't have been able to go that fast, he was like, I'm going, I know where the finish line is. And, and it's amazing to see their attitudes yeah. when they get to the track. Um, he, so, so Greek had come to the track a number of times for family and friends yeah. day, yeah. Um, different events where, you know, meet the race horse day. <laughs> And uh, sometimes we'd have him set up in like an outside pen and same thing. Every time he heard that horn calling yeah, the racers to the gate, yeah. he would stop what he was doing and he'd be like, I'm ready, where are we going? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so there, there's a lot of them that they love, they love their it. job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a horse at the track right now called Pure Edition. She has just won seven races in a row. Mm -hmm. And her, her last race was pretty amazing where um, coming down the stretch for the wire, I mean, she got passed by a nose, and we were like, oh, yeah, this is the end of it. You can watch her pin her ears and dig Go in, in, and she ended up winning and went past this other horse. Oh. They know where the finish line is. They oh, love yeah. their job, and some of them just have those heart where you're, you're not beating me today, and yeah. just, and, and it's amazing to see how proud they are. You, they know when they've won. They know when they've raised well. I mean, they'll get back to their stall and they're bucking and kicking and squealing and, and they know when they've raced well and they're what we would call sharp afterwards yeah. and feeling yeah. good. So yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It just just so much horse doesn't know that he got the top Exactly, back, exactly. Those yes, horses those know. horses definitely know that they got their picture taken in yeah. the inner circle. Yeah, yeah. big deal that day. Yeah. Um, what are some considerations with respect to previous injuries that could impact them in other disciplines? Um, I think look, it, it kind of looks at what is your desired discipline. Yeah. Um, in general, standard breeds are a lot tougher than any other breed. It amazes me and it amazes my surgeons sometimes right. when I'll be like, hey, can you take a look at this ultrasound or can you take a look at this x-ray? And we'll laugh and be like, if this was a warm blood, this thing would be on three legs and laying down and think it was dying. Whereas because it's a standard bread, it just raced this weekend yeah. and, you know, got second in the top class. Uh, and, and so they're a lot hardier than people think. So even if they have had injuries, the impact on them is less than maybe we would consider in other breeds, just because mm -hmm. they're tougher. Um, 
And, and so yes, I mean, we want to look at, do they have a recent suspensory injury that has a big black hole in it? Okay, well then maybe he's not going to be able to start his dressage training tomorrow. Um, but if we have a horse that has maybe bowed its SDF tendon as a three-year-old and now it's six, and it's set and it's cold and it's tight and it's not bothering the horse, mm -hmm. well, the likelihood of that impacting that horse is, is very, very low. Um, so, I mean, I always joke when I look at, at Greek, he, so Greek broke his left front sesamoid three times. So he broke the inside, then the outside, then the inside again. He had surgery for three times on that as, as across his very long race career. Um, when you look at the extras of his left front leg, he definitely has some arthritic change in that. Um, and yet he, that was, he was sound on it, you know? He was sound, he flexed well on it. It was a little fat and a little puffy, and you'd look at it and say, hey, that looks a little bit funny. But he would happily gallop across the fields with me and not put in a step on it. So, again, people kind of underestimate the toughness of these horses, that sometimes what would be considered um, a very significant problem in another horse, I think are less significant in standard rides just because their hearts are so big. Um, and looking at when did an injury happen? So again, an injury that happened as a two or three year old, but this horse has been racing successfully on it for another two, three years after the fact, well, likely that injury isn't gonna impact them. Um, I think we're gonna get into a little bit more about kind of transitioning these guys from, mm -hmm. from kind of racing to riding, but um, uh, I think don't be as scared about some of the yeah. reasons why they're being retired. Um, be, because you aren't going to be asking them to go pace a mile in a minute and 52 seconds. You're, yeah. you're going to be asking them to do different types of work um, that overall are slightly less intense work than mm -hmm. what they've been doing now. Even if you want to do well through dressage with him, it, it's still going to be way less work than what he was doing previously. Different yeah. work, Different work, but much less intense. So, so I they will dive into that wholeheartedly because they'll think, oh, this is yeah. so easy. They're triers, they're <laughs> such, I always, I would always joke and be like, sometimes I think Greek has no idea what I'm asking him to do, but <laughs> yeah. man, he'll try and try to give me what I want. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, I think the biggest thing about them is yeah. whatever job, they're, they're, they're job horses, they like to have a job and whatever job it is that you give them, they will throw themselves into it. They will have no idea what you're asking, but they will say, all right, I guess this is what we're doing today, and they will throw themselves in it, and, yeah. and I, that's a huge testament to the personality yeah. of the breed, is, is they'll, they'll try. They, they may not have any clue, but they will try. try. Yeah. yeah, and keep their cool a little bit. Exactly, sure. yeah. So now we'll move on to...